interaction with Mr. Ricky Singh today. I am Romil Barthol and today I am pretty excited to be with Ricky Singh. Another reason for that is that today is 17th of April and then it was in 2017, the same day I was there in Boston running the Boston Marathon, which has been, I mean, major turning point as far as endurance events have been concerned in my life. Today we have amongst us Ricky Singh. We met last year, similar time on the Everest base camp. We've been uh, with the different teams, so we've been training there, doing our bit of acclimatization. That's how we interacted in person. Before that, we've been interacting on uh, social media platforms. And uh, it's evening here, so good evening to all of you. And to Ricky Singh, it's good morning because he's there based in US and he's been extremely busy because of the COVID thing and he forms part of the essential services as I discussed with him yesterday. So he's been having pretty hectic life rather than the lockdown which we all are having. So I appreciate sir for your time today. For the purpose of uh, those who will not be attending, we'll be recording the session and all these recordings will be shared with everyone so that you can always uh, take notes in case you plan to do any adventure activity. Even if you're not doing adventure, the kind of experiences he's going to share and planning those will be uh, very much fruitful in your expeditions or your targets. With this as brief background, I had shared the details about uh, Ricky Singh on the media for all those who still missed out. Major things, I'll request you only to say because I might miss out on two things. So over to Ricky sir, stage is all yours. Thank you so much, uh, Romil, for a wonderful introduction. I'm not used to getting such wonderful words from somebody as accomplished as you. Uh, no, no, sir, it's, it's thank you. Thing, <laughs> as, a, as a fellow Everester and as somebody that has done great things for uh, others, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here and it's an honor to be here. Uh, I have done, I don't know, pretty much everything there is running wise from 5Ks to 10Ks, half full uh, ultras and, and 135 and uh, pretty much done all, all running related stuff. And, uh, also did Everest. We've done, uh, I spent three years trying to plan my Everest journey. I have done that. I am also an entrepreneur and, and uh, I have right. my so own I want you to I want you to start from the moment you left India to US after your 12th and then start from there. That will be very interesting. Sure, sure. So I left India in 1988 after I finished my, uh, my high school, my 12th. And uh, I came to the United States and, and I got admission into a college here, uh, New Jersey Institute of Technology. I did my bachelor's in computer science. And uh, while I was studying, I was also working to kind of pay for my education. So I was working at a, at a gas station. I was working at nights and I worked four years to pay for my uh, college. And uh, pretty much at the end, when I got done my college, I figured that uh, there was more money in business than there was in working for somebody. And uh, making money was at that point very, very important for me. So I started my own business. I started my own uh, uh, retail stores, my own gas stations, and uh, achieved a decent amount of success over the years. When I was young, money was very important to me and I spent a lot of time and effort uh, focusing on how to make money. But as you get older, you realize that uh, health is important too. And uh, when I turned 37, my son was born. And uh, when my son was born, uh, that's when I really figured, hey, it's about time to do something for myself, to, to get healthy, get, get better, and make sure that I leave a legacy that's beyond money, you know, that, that has experiences, that I'm able to go uh, play soccer with him, or uh, play cricket with him, or, or I'm able to, you know, dance at his wedding and, and have those right. experiences that uh, uh, help allows you to do. You know, if you're sick, you can't have too many experiences with your family. All those experiences are kind of negative experiences. So I wanted to have positive experiences. I wanted to travel with him. I wanted to uh, go out and play football with him. And all that right. stuff I could only do if I got physically fitter. So I Absolutely. started running. Uh, it was hard, you know. Initially, I could barely uh, run, I don't know, 100 meters, 200 meters without stopping and, and uh, you know, panting for breath. But then you persevere and then gradually uh, 5K becomes easy. Then a couple months later, I did a 10K and then did a bunch of 10Ks. Every weekend we would do a 10K. 
And then after I got comfortable with the 10K, started doing half marathons. So did a few half marathons. After I got comfortable with half marathons, went to marathons. And then I did one in every state. So I did 52 marathons, one after another. Oh my after God. I finished, <laughs> so after I finished with marathons, I said, now what? You know, have to do something longer. Marathon wasn't challenging enough. So started doing ultra marathons. 50K, 50 miles, 100 miles, 24 hour runs. And then I did the Brazil 135. And then in between, the Everest bug hit me. And I said, <laughs> I want to <laughs> I wanna do Everest. And how can we do it? And then started planning for Everest. And it took me three years to go from uh, zero to Everest. So, so that's you that to say, that's my journey. Before 37, no, no running, no activity as such? Nothing, nothing. Before 37, it was all about, you know, getting up, going to work, making money, coming home. Oh my God. And then repeating again. So spent the first 37 years figuring out how to be financially successful. And then after that, spent the other 13 trying to figure out how to be healthy and, and you know, make use of the financial freedom it's that it. lets you do all these things that uh, require a lot of time and money. So that means you want to say that your son brought this fitness bug inside you with his birth. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we all have kids, we all have families and, and their arrival sometimes changes the way you think. It changes your outlook right. on life. And uh, when my kids were born, uh, it changed my outlook of life. It was no longer about myself. It was, you know, you start thinking of the next generation and you start thinking of how your actions today affect them and how you can inspire your own kids and family. And that was a big part of me where I always ask myself, if something happens, do I want my son to quit or do I want my son to keep moving? You know, push through the the uncomfortable scenarios? Do I want him to give up at the first time of uh, uncomfort? And the answer is no, of course. You know, you want to push through a little bit. You don't want to get hurt, but you, you do want to try and push through the boundaries, see what the limits are. Right. And, you know, we've been pushing boundaries ever since. So tell me this, you know, one question which always surprises me, you know, uh, you started in 37. At 50, you did Everest. I was 40, yeah. I am 43 once I did Everest and everybody around me was like, you know, if you are 20s or 30s maximum, Everest is acceptable. How did you manage to get the support? And US is not the place where you train for Everest because they are not, I mean, you are not uh, in those peaks wherein you train for that high altitude kind of a thing. You, you have pretty cold places, but then those altitudes wherein you have that lack of oxygen, those kind of feelings, 7,000 meter peaks you don't have. So how did you? Plan it in such difficult conditions. Tell me so that. Two, so there are two main phases to Everest training. One is the physical training and one is the mental training. And the most okay. important thing is the mental training, is, is how to be comfortable being uncomfortable. So, you know, living on base camp or living at camp one, camp two, camp three, or going through all these uh, ice falls and ladders, it's how do you control your mind? Your mind is playing tricks on you. Your mind is saying, hey, you have a headache. Your mind is saying, hey, uh, you know, your feet is hurting. Your mind is saying it's cold. How do you overcome uh, your fears? And, and that for me was a big part of Everest training. And that is what I learned during running all these long distances. You know, right. inevitably, when you do 50 plus marathons, something wrong is going to happen. I showed up okay. at one marathon and I forgot my shoes. And the only shoes I had was my dress shoes. Oh. Right? And, and, and guess what? We finished in those dress shoes. I mean, it was <laughs> uncomfortable. It wasn't fun. Uh, right. we got into trouble afterwards, but we managed. I remember one particular marathon. Uh, I, I did not have, uh, it was cold and, and I didn't have any cold gear at all. So I went oh. to the race director and I said, can you give me a hat, please? It's, it's really cold. And I don't have anything and I can't find anything. And he was kind enough to give me his own stuff. So okay. it is amazing. And, and the biggest thing for Everest is besides the physical training, besides, uh, you know, knowing how to wear crampons and 
and how to use the ice axe and how to uh, get out of an avalanche situation is also awareness of where you are and trying to be able to control your mind. On Everest, you spend a lot of time by yourself. You spend a lot of time in a tent. You spend a lot of time in cold, dark, huddled in your sleeping bag. It's what you think. It's, it's how you, your mind, uh, you're able to control your mind. That to me is what Everest is all about. So Everest is not just a big mountain. It's an obstacle that has to be uh, tackled one by one. And your biggest tool isn't uh, your ice axe or crampons. Your biggest support is your mind. Once you learn to control your mind, things get a lot easier. Great. That's nice. So tell me, you know, as I was asking you, the you started from base camp, your preparation, and then you slowly build it up till the top of the Everest. So take us through that journey because not many people would be that big a planner or that details of planning nobody would do. I'm pretty sure. So please take, uh, share it with the viewers. Sure, sure. So once I decided I was going to do Everest, I said, I'm going to do Everest uh, when I turn 50. So I had uh, three years to plan my Everest journey. So I said, okay. I'm going to go to Everest area, that whole Kumbu region. I'm going to go there twice a year. So I would go every six months and spend four to six weeks over there. So the first oh. time I went, I just went to base camp. Went to base camp and came back. This was this year? This is 2017. Oh. Just, just went there, went to base camp, did the tracking, just got comfortable with, with the culture, the people, and kind of figured out logistics. Uh, Correct. With, you know, was trying out different companies. Right. Six months later, I went from uh, base camp to a 6,000 meter peak. So I went Lobucha Peak. Once oh, again, nice. I hired a I hired a different uh, company and uh, different Sherpas. So I was just trying different logistics. Correct. So by the end of Labucha Peak, I had kind of figured out the company I was going to use for my Everest expedition. I had zeroed right. in on my Sherpa. Uh, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Okay. My third trip was in 2018, and I wanted to be on Everest. So okay. I signed up. I signed up with a company and I told them, I want to go to Camp 3 on Everest. No higher than Camp 3. <laughs> okay. Um, so I was going to live on base camp for uh, four weeks, five weeks, whatever it takes. And then right. Camp 1, Camp 2, Camp 3, touch Camp 3, sleep all night at Camp 3 and come back. Because that would give me a, a great idea on uh, Absolutely. How, to, how to do the ice fall, uh, the stuff that was required. I could test all my gear. I could uh, meet a lot of people. So I met a lot of people there that I could ask for advice for my uh, next trip in 2019. Right. Then after Camp 3, I want to do an 8,000 meter peak. So the only fall peak, uh, 8,000 meter that was available was Manasri at that time. So, okay. I, uh, so I used that same company, same Sherpa, same gear, everything from Manasri. And we summited okay. Manasri in October. And then, you know, of course, Everest is next. And uh, we successfully scaled Everest. So my Everest training was five different phases. 5,000 meters, 6,000 meters, 7,000 meters, 8,000 meters, and then summit. Every time I would go to Nepal, my goal was to go 1,000 meters higher. Right. So I started with uh, 5,000 meters. Then next time I went to 6,000 meters. Next time I went to 7,000 meters. Next time, I went to 8,000 meters. And then finally, Everest, which is 8,800 meters. So Amazing. So it's very methodical. <laughs> I did not, yeah, I did not want to go from uh, sea level to Everest. I wasn't that comfortable. So I said, I'm going to break it up into five phases. I'm going to break right. it up into 1,000 meters at a time. And just like running, where, you know, you don't think about 100 miles when you're running. You're thinking right. about the next one mile or next five miles or the next uh, aid station. And then finally you start thinking about the next step, you know, next uh, place where you can meet your crew or next place where you can uh, grab a cup of water. So you always want to break up a big journey into smaller right. uh, journeys. So and that's exactly the point I, I want. Yeah. So the point I want everybody to understand is, you know, if you have this kind of planning, 
your success rate becomes much higher so it's very very important to listen to this and make sure you understand it you know listening is fine but then understand what all it goes through because frankly telling you i've been on everest or nepal only once i mean uh, once was for taking the shepherds and all but the moment i was on the everest region that was the moment i realized i'll never come back because the situations are so difficult once you are at camp 3 for the first time you don't want to be there again because you know it's so painful everything is against you be it weather be it your headache be it the kind of food you are eating so having that much amount of motivation to go back again doing it i mean at some only i mean very very less people would have the guts to do it now sitting here i can always say that okay i'll go it next year but then once you are at those altitudes it's very difficult to convince yourself to do that again so tell me what was your mantra which told you know you have decided so you'll do it again or you have to finish it till the time i mean till the time you don't finish it you will not rest so please share that mantra with us so the mantra that i talk to myself is i commit and i shall not quit so you know the biggest thing is committing to a goal and once you commit to a goal you say i am not going to quit for something trivial you know of course you know if your life is in danger and and something bad right. happens then you have to make the right move but i am not going to commit i'm not going to quit the first time i have a headache or i'm not going to quit the first time uh, i have an upset stomach i mean those are okay. all relatively small things in the in the big picture so the biggest thing is once you made a commitment is you stick to your commitment you say to yourself that no matter what happens i will try and control as many variables as i can and i am not going to quit i am certainly not going to quit for discomfort or or for getting bored or or right. something silly you know i i met i was in 2018 and we met one guy over there and he would call his wife every day okay and 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 i would i would ask him like you know what what is it that you're trying to gain by calling every day right and and eventually you know he got so homesick he said I I have to go back. I have to go back, and he quit right in the middle. And he was a fit guy. I mean, this guy was really, really fit. He deserved okay. to be on Everest, but mentally, he wasn't ready okay. to spend the six weeks in isolation or six weeks with himself uh, to make that journey. You have to be ready to make sacrifices. You cannot, you know, be in other world and be on Everest. If you're on Everest. Everest you commands hundred percent of your attention. You cannot be thinking of other things when you're going through that ice wall because True. you will get hurt or hurt others. Right. Bad things are going to happen if you're not there hundred percent. So Very true. being hundred percent is important, and and that's what commitment means. You know, being in the moment, being uh, there, making sure that all your time and attention is. Uh, on the task that is required right very important to be there in the moment yes, so your sentence about that commitment reminds me of that famous bollywood dialogue by salman khan i am sure you relate the same thing that once i have committed ek baar jab commitment kar di to main apne aap ki bhi nahi sunta so it's kind of same thing which you want to say right that's right bilkul amazing that is that is so right so that this so was everest so uh, as you know this is the third time we are speaking about everest earlier was bharat then dr mahajan who were there with you i mean last year yes. uh, once we were there together tell me about this brazil 135 why is it so very popular race or why is it considered such a difficult race so brazil is 135 miles and it has huge uh, ups and downs so cumulative over the 135 miles you are going to gain 30000 feet of uh, elevation which is the okay. same height as everest so imagine yeah. being everest in 48 hours or, or 50 hours or 60 hours right one after another and it's a huge cumulative gain 30000 feet and it is 20000 feet of drop daytime okay. it's very hot very uh, muggy and then it rains and that uh, trail becomes into a mud slide lot of rain every uh, every year it rains during that time so it's the rainy season it's the summer it's extremely uh, humid it's tropical weather there and this is a remote remote part 
135 so 135 miles is not a flat 135 miles it's a huge uh, there's there's mountain ranges there so this is on the andes mountains so you're doing that con constantly going up going down is very very hard on your body yeah because the very fact uh, the only eight indians i think who have done brazil one day paris peaks of the kind of difficulty it's going to i mean pose to you yes absolutely very few people have done it and this is an invitation race only so once again okay uh, when you when you apply uh, you have to send your running resume and they look at it and only 100 and they cap it at 100 people okay so it's so kind of like bad water yes it is it is actually a sister race for bad water so if you want okay. to qualify for bad water brazil 135 is the easiest and the quickest way to qualify for bad water and what is the cut off time for this how many hours are given to finish this uh, 220 or kilometers so it's 60 hours so brazil 135 but if you okay. want to qualify for bad water it's 48 hours oh for that you not you don't get the complete 60 hours qualification no no you can so you can do 60 hours you'll still get the medal you'll still right. be listed as a finisher for brazil 135 but if your plan is to go to bad water 135 then you have to finish in 48 because the cut off for brazil is 48 hours okay so tell so me one water. instance yeah for brazil 135 tell me one memorable instance you would like to share with us where you felt you know that you would give up or not go to the finish line something which is i'm sure uh, it's easier now but then that moment of time you would have thought no this is the ultimate thing which has come up major challenge yeah so uh at about 110 mile uh, there was a huge huge hill and uh, okay. i i i i was trying to run and it was just getting harder and harder and harder and uh, you know i my i had blisters all over my feet my feet had swollen up i had started with a size 10 shoe and i was now wearing a size 12 shoe and even that oh. shoe was tight so i had my feet had swollen up and i had all sorts of blisters and i really at that point didn't care i didn't want to go any further and uh it's kind kind of you know giving up but i had a crew of wonderful people i had uh three people on my crew and they were absolutely right. wonderful and and uh you know they they stopped me and i said hey stop all this you know self pity and and here have a drink and and let's take care of your feet and they took care of my blisters and uh, before you know you you're back at it again so Uh, like in any race there's there's lots of highs and there's lots of lows and the point right. is when you get too high not to get too excited and when you get low don't give up just make sure that you're able to do one step at a time and eventually it'll all even out amazing uh, another thing which i in you know, one say came to know that you are uh, were doing 50 stages 50 marathons why this thing it started and then what was the target because i believe you were saying you wanted to finish it before you turn 50 and you did it much before that yes. tell so me about started, that journey sure so i started running when i was 37 so when i did right. my first marathon i was 38 so and i was thinking what long term fitness so i said hey uh, would be really nice if i can keep running and have some sort of a goal so at that point my goal was about four marathons a year every three months i would do a marathon okay. and i said you know Uh, why not combine running and traveling so there's 50 states in the us and the capital right. dc so that makes it 51 i said why not go to a different state every 3 months go to a different race every 3 months that would be uh, a good way to travel see this country and and meet new people meet new experience uh, run on different terrains so that for me was important and then uh, once you start running every 3 months you kind of get in good shape and then uh, you start running every month you start running twice a month and those races finished pretty uh, quick so i finished 3 years before i had planned so i wanted to do 50 marathons 50 states by the time i turned 50 that was my right. original goal but because we we got so good at it we got really fit started doing more marathons uh, quicker So at the end, I was doing one almost every month. We oh. finished. Yeah, we finished. We achieved our goal. Had three more years to finish, and then I said, "What else can I do uh, 
to celebrate my 50th birthday and we figured you know nothing better than everest okay that intrigues me what is going to be there for 75 then you know there is hardly anything <laughs> left <laughs> you no, know you're 50 you have such high goals what is uh, going to be there so, there's so much uh, to do in life so you know sometimes it's not just about your personal goals it's about what right. you give back to the community so uh, as i get older it's more about what i am giving back to the community of uh, runners uh, mountaineers to the community i live in city i live in right. to the country i belong so it's all about uh, about giving now it's all about sharing now it's all about sharing your experiences it's all about uh, sharing your journey, sharing your goals, and making sure that you're not the only one to be able to do this, that you can share right. it with other people, motivate other people, and hopefully help other people achieve their goals. There's nothing Wonderful. more satisfying than uh, helping somebody uh, achieve their goals. Wonderful. Great thoughts. So again, you know, going to different states every three months, then subsequently a month, then Everest, how, what was the response of family? You know, because family would again see it as, you know, personal goals, doing everything, because that's what the general trend is. You know, we say that running is a very selfish sport, as we say. So what was their response? And then, as we said, 50, you wanted to be on Everest. What was their response? Because I'm sure it, it's not easy. No, not at all. So initially, they were very reluctant. They were like, you know, why do you have to do it? Uh, ye kaisi, you know, soch hai, selfish hai, anniversary hai, birthday hai. So, you know, you miss right. a lot of family engagements. But then you kind of uh, explain to them the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is this is something that uh, you're excited about. This is something that helps you in achieving your goals. Uh, this is something that makes you a better person. This is an outlet for your uh, frustrations and and all the other things that go along in, in life. And there's a bigger goal. And the, every time I would go somewhere, I think I came back more motivated. I met more people. Uh, my outlook kind of got better. Uh, you kind of see experiences that you normally would not in your normal day-to-day -day life. So you meet so many people and, and you get inspired by, by meeting people, by talking to people. And that to me was very important. Great. So, uh, just for the benefit of viewers, I would, uh, all those who will join late, let me tell you, we are going to have this session till 7.45 and then 15 minutes we will have Q&A. So, anybody who has got any questions, is uh, feel free to uh, put it on the chat window and then we will take it in the last 15 minutes. And subsequently also, knowing Ricky, I am sure he would be uh, available for all the questions which are there, which come up uh, subsequently in the WhatsApp group or indi individual chats. So, that's uh, very nice of him. Tell me your journey of entrepreneurship, ultra marathons, Everest. What has been the most challenging thing out of, uh, I mean, those last few years you've been there in the US? So the biggest uh, challenge for me has been how to keep everything together, how to be able to achieve my goals, how to do right. my time management and still have a family. So, you know, I, I meet a lot of people that are very accomplished. But somehow along the way, they've, they've lost their family or they haven't been able to convince their family to stay uh, together. And, and they've kind of become loners or uh, what I wanted to do. I mean, you know, everything I do, I make sure I take my family into confidence. I make sure they understand that I've done my homework. I've done the hard work. I've done the, the training necessary. And this is not something that I get up in the morning and say, I'm going to go Everest. I'm very methodical. And then they see that. They know that. And that gives them confidence. Also, my track record. The most important thing is to make sure your family understands that, that you are committed to them. And, and when uh, it is required, you're willing to give up all these, uh, I would say, selfish goals for the good right. of the family. So somebody gets sick or, or somebody needs attention or, or you need to take care of something. You drop everything right there and then. You know, running is important, but it's not as important as my kids. It is not as important as, as my mother. It's not as important as my wife. Those come first. So it's very important to have the right priorities. So running is no. just one part of life. It is not the only thing in life. 
So I don't get up and say, hey, I'm going to run even though I'm hurt today because I have to run or my schedule says I'm going to run. So it's not just about running. It's about how running and all these other things fit in your life and your lifestyle. Amazing. But Ricky, tell me now that, you know, there must have been a lot of instances wherein you've had extremely challenging times. So has there been any instance wherein you have felt, you know, uh, you are closest to the God, not physically. I mean, physically, we know it's close to Everest, but then mentally when you have given up kind of feel that kind of feel during Everest or anything like that, similar to that. So once, uh, once I got to Everest, I had achieved my goal. There was nothing else I wanted to do except come right. back down. And uh, once you get to the top, you're extremely tired, you're extremely beat up, and your motivation kind of goes down in the sense that you've achieved your goal. The adrenaline is, is gone. So when I was coming down from Everest to Camp 4, uh, I remember that that was my toughest time physically, you know, even mentally. Uh, I, I really didn't care at that point. Nothing was left. I had achieved everything that I wanted to do. And I wanted to go down, but it was extremely hard. I was tired. I was beat up. Uh, there were people falling everywhere. There were lines of people. And uh, it was hard. And at that point, if I didn't have the right team with me, maybe I wouldn't have been able to come back. So oh. it was very, very important to have the right team with you, the right people with you, uh, people that can look at you and see that you're struggling and you need a little bit of extra motivation that come up to you and say, hey, let's go. You know, I'll move forward. You move behind me or, or you move forward. I'm, I'm holding you or I'm with you. And they are constantly talking to you. True. So I would say the toughest time for me was coming down from Everest to Camp 4. That was really, really tough. True. So in fact, uh, uh, for the consumption of all the listeners, I would also suggest that you know, if you look at the data, most of the deaths on Everest, they don't take place at any other place, but then while coming back. You know, once we were there, base camp also, where we came to know that one of the guys from Gurgaon, he was while coming back had died, which was again very traumatic because you are waiting for your turn to climb, and then you come to know that somebody else has died. So it happened with us also, you know, we suffered maximum once we were coming back because the way you said, that is the time once you have lost your momentum because you have achieved your target. And then you lost your so much of energy while coming down and there are people, hordes of people who are there climbing up and then it's a jostle between whether you come down first or the other person is going up first. So tell me for ultra marathons or marathons or this, what kind of training you used to follow so that you could be successful as far as the uh, actual expedition or actual uh, goal is concerned. So most of my training was, uh, I would start backwards from the date of, of the event. So okay. uh, let, let's say the Brazil event was January. I had started training four months before. And uh, most of my training was trying to spend as much time as I could on my feet. So okay. even though I did, I did a little bit speed training and all that stuff, but most of the training I did was long, slow miles with a backpack okay. on. I wanted to build endurance. You want to make sure your feet are able to withstand. And your training has to be very specific. So if you're going to do a short event, so by short event, I mean half marathon, a marathon, uh, you have to train for that. Anything big, uh, it's more about uh, your mind and, and making sure that uh, you're able to function uh, in a normal way. So the biggest thing is take, being able to take care of your feet, making sure you're not chafing, making sure you have a spare pair of shoes and, and some extra clothes and making sure you have enough calories and practicing how to take those calories uh, right. during an event. Okay, another thing uh, which comes to my mind now is that, you know, once we were doing Everest, we knew that we had done a lot of marathons or ultra marathons, but then Everest is a different ball game. It helps a bit, but then if you think you are a good runner, you will be a good in mountains that doesn't hold. Right, so it doesn't, it helps to a certain extent, it's not going to guarantee you being there on top. So how did you train specifically for those conditions or for Everest altitude? 
So you know, being a runner uh, gives you actually no advantage on on Everest. So on I, Everest, it's a, it's a totally different ball game. There's less oxygen, and uh, depending on your body's ability to process whatever little bit oxygen is there, you're gonna react differently. So for me, the biggest thing, like I said, was to prepare mentally. Physically, I was in good shape at sea level. I had done everything I could have at sea level. So I would just put a, a 10 kilo uh, backpack and just go out and just go up and down a hill or just go walk for eight, 10 hours or, you know, do four hours in the morning and four hours in the evening, which was the bulk of my Everest training. But the biggest oh. thing, if you're interested in Everest, is learn how to control your mind. You have to be able to quiet your mind. If your mind is saying, hey, uh, look at the winds and it's really cold and it's really windy. What, what do I do? I wish I was home. You need to be able to control that and say, hey, we're here to do Everest. It's not that bad. Lots of people have done it. And in, in six weeks, we'll be all done and I'll be home. Hey. I'll be in, in a nice warm place. I'll be eating puri chole or whatever else you like. <laughs> hey. <laughs> so. Being able to talk to myself was at least, I thought, my biggest uh, training. To be able to tell myself that uh, no matter what happens, I'm still uh, loved, I'm still uh, respected, I'll still be able to go back to my life after these six weeks. Nothing's going to change. And, and that is the most important uh, part of training, is not to get over-invested, not to say, I'm going to do Everest at any cost, even if I die, I don't care. I mean, those sort of things are not the way to think. True. Everybody wants to make a commitment. Everybody wants to try hard. But it, you got to make rational choices. And at some point, if you get over yourself or if you think it's really, really hard physically or get in trouble, you've got to be able to strong enough to make the right decision and say, uh, folks, uh, the mountain's going to be here next year again. Right. Let's get back and, and, and come back next year stronger, working on whatever weaknesses you found. Very good point. I mean, that's why they say, you know, got to respect the mountain once you're climbing. You cannot say that, okay, if it's not your day. You've got to understand that. You've got to understand. And you're just a small speck in that big yeah. universe. You know, the mountain is always going to win. You, you know, when I hear people say they've conquered mountains, it just makes me cringe. Like, you do not conquer mountains. Mountain lets you get to the top. Right. My Lord, that's it. True. You have to respect the mountain. But the other thing which intrigues all of us listening to this is, you know, you've been such an accomplished businessman in the US. How do you manage your time? There's so many people who are working for you. How do you manage time for so many <laughs> different activities? You know, it's not just one because people generally are busy in their office work where it, you know, nobody's dependent on you. Nobody's salary is dependent on you. But then your case, you manage so much of work and then so many diverse fields, be it running, be it, and not just in US, you run at different places. You go for expeditions every six months. How do you manage your work so very well? So the biggest thing is time management. It's, it's how to manage right. time. And uh, the other thing is your management style. So you, you're not trying to concentrate everything in yourself. You're not trying to micromanage okay. everything. So the key is to have the right people in the right place. The key is to have the right people in your life. The right. key is to have the right people in your businesses. And the key is to have the right people surround you. People that motivate you, people that uh, help you, people that uh, give you new interesting perspectives and, and aren't afraid to tell the truth. A lot of times, a lot of people or a lot of leaders surround themselves with yes men people that right. the only reason they say something is just to please you. And that is not what you want in business. You want people to be empowered. You want people to be able to make decisions. And then once you have your infrastructure in place, once you have the right people in place, it gives you a lot of freedom. Right. It gives you a lot of flexibility. It gives you the ability to leave for a few weeks and, and be, you know, incommunicado, not, not being able to contact uh, like I was on Everest. But it's okay. Once you've trained people right and, and you've uh, you know chosen the right people for the right positions, it becomes easier. Very right. 
So with this, I think we'll have to call you once again to understand all these management and entrepreneurship lessons because this is too short a time. And then it's a very, very valid point which I mentioned, you know, because generally people suffer with this that they would do everything on their own and not decentralizing the thing because you need to have a lot of faith in the people to address and then they'll only be able to live up to the expectations once they know that you have their, I mean, they have your blessings. Then only they should be able to do that. So that's a very, very valid point. Uh, other thing, tell me, in physical aspects of training, what is the most important thing? You know, uh, let's say you've done long runs and all. Uh, so did you follow a structured plan for all your events or has it been like, you know, with the normal training every time we keep doing events after event? How does uh, that work? So when I was doing marathons, I would break up my training into three major parts. You know, one was uh, a speed run. Okay. And the second would be a, a tempo or a fart leg. And the third would be a, a long, slow run. So I would okay. substitute. Uh, so my speed work was very important. So I would always do my speed work. I would always do my long run. So those two runs were non-negotiable. The third okay. run, I would either do a tempo run or a fart leg, or I would uh, do some hill repeats. Right. So I would run three times a week and depending on right. uh, what time I was looking for or what distance I was doing, I would uh, go up and down. But right. minimum of three times a week. And uh, when I was doing ultras, I would do, instead of one long run, I would do two long runs. So I would do okay. maybe a 20 miler on Saturday and then another 20 miler on, on Sunday. Or I would do a 20 mile in the morning and then in the evening do another 20 mile and oh, then yeah. once in a while what you want to do is you want to break up your training a little bit so i'll tell you what i did uh, last month is last month i said we're gonna run for one hour every three hours for 24 hours so i would run okay. one hour and then i would come back home or i would go to work and i would do whatever else i had to do for two hours and then run for one hour so that teaches your body how to run when you're tired that Correct. teaches your mind how to react uh, to different uh, situations. Situations, so, absolutely. So, so you know, you, you, let's say I started at 7 o'clock. So I ran 7 to 8. And then 8 to 10, I was free to do whatever else I wanted. And at True. 10 o'clock, I ran again for one hour. Take that and then next two hours, I was free to do uh, whatever else I had to do. Take care of phone calls, take care of business, uh, see family or whatever. So I would do this for 24 hours. And then once in a while, this would break up your training and teach your body how to run when it's tired. Okay, nice. Okay, tell me another thing. Before we started this, there were four points you were discussing that you wanted to share with everyone. Or could you please elaborate on that? Yes, so you know, when I'm doing my planning, for me, that is the most important thing. So even more right. important than doing it, the most important thing is to plan it correctly. So I have right. what I call a four-step process. So okay. there are four steps that I always, always follow. So I write it down on paper. The first step for me is what I call a current situation analysis. It is an analysis of where I am right now. So let's say I want to run a marathon in, in four months. So my current situation would be I'm not in good shape and uh, I need to do uh, more stuff and I haven't run for three months. So that would be my current situation. When you right. do your current situation, you have to be very honest with yourself. You cannot be delusional. You cannot say, uh, I, am, I am super fit when you're not fit. So you have to right. be uh, accurate with yourself. You have to be truthful to, for yourself. The second step for me is what I call a hypothesis. Hypothesis is nothing but an if-then statement. So I say to myself, if, I follow my plan, then I will be ready on marathon day. So whatever my plan is. So hypothesis is always an if then statement. If I run three times a week and I follow my plan, then I will get fitter. If right. I go to Nepal uh, every six months for uh, four weeks, when I get uh, 2019, I'm ready for Everest, I will be able to summit. So hypothesis is just an if-then statement. If I do this, then this happens. Correct. The third step for me is the action steps. 
is when I actually book my ticket, is when I actually convert those words into action. Okay. So for me, action steps is where I hold myself accountable and say, hey, we've done the planning. Now it's time to actually put things down and do it. Book my ticket. Right. Uh, make my reservations, you know, that kind of stuff. Make it concrete. And the fourth step is the verification. So verification is, is your if, is your if then statement working? So uh, verification for me on that marathon would be to be able to finish it in the time that I had planned. If, right. if everything works good and, and I reach my goal, then I had a good plan. And then I can follow that same plan again. But if, let's say, I had trouble with my stomach or my shoes, then I would fix it. So that would be part of my next current situation analysis. Right. Absolutely. So four, four step process. The first step is an honest evaluation, which we call a current situation analysis. The second right. step would be a hypothesis, which is nothing but an if then statement. The third step would be action steps, which is you're actually doing it and committing yourself. And the fourth step is the verification, which is, did you achieve your goal or not? So Wonderful. for me, no matter what I do, no matter where I am in life, I always follow these four steps, whether that be in business, whether that be while I'm running or mountaineering, or even in my general life. I like to put things on paper and make a plan. And the four step is part of my plan. Yeah, so you can see that. I mean, this holds not just for running, for everything in life in general. If you follow the, these four steps, I think things are much clearer in your mind what to expect from where you are rather than where you want to be. I mean, exactly. That's very important. So with this, I think we'll start taking questions now because there are a few people who have asked very, very pertinent questions. So uh, first question is, uh, okay, so we start with uh, Pawan. So he wants to ask, you know, health, everybody uh, in the kind of events you've been doing is very, very important. So anything particular you want to say that how to maintain health in case you're doing uh, any event and things are not in your favor? How do you manage such situation? Uh, you mean physical health? Yeah, physical health. Yeah, so once you've trained, you're, you're, you're in good physical shape. So that's, that's not going to be an issue. So let's say you want to run a marathon. If you've done and followed your plan, you're going to be in good shape. The point at that, at that point, you have to kind of think about it mentally. You, you cannot be scared of the event or, or if things go wrong, then you have to be able to adjust your event. So let's say you're planning a four hour marathon. And at mile 10 or 12, you kind of tweak something or uh, something's hurting. You, you stop for a moment, kind of reevaluate uh, whatever it is and uh, kind of change your plans uh, to make it uh, more reasonable. Right. So next question is, you know, 50 marathons, 50 states, ultra marathons, Everest. How do you recover from all this and how... Uh, do you include physiotherapy in this in case you get injuries? Because at times, with these kind of activities, it's obvious to get injured as well. So how do you cope up with that? So injuries are, are part and parcel of your life. Right. Uh, my belief is if, if something's not hurting, then you're not working hard enough. So there's always something hurting. And it's right. always uh, important to manage whatever is hurting so that uh, it doesn't impact your day-to-day -day life. So uh, if I have blisters on my feet, then uh, instead of uh, running, I would do uh, biking or I would do some other exercise that does not involve that part of the body. But okay. being fit is not just running. It's not just uh, 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 walking. It's There's lots of other things you can do. Uh, yoga is one of them or just stretching is one of them or just planning, using that downtime to plan your next event is, is also important. Or, or trying to do your research on, on your clothes or on your shoes or on your strategies. So fitness is not just doing it. It's also thinking about it all the time. It's also making sure that whatever is hurting, you give it sufficient recovery time. True. So you mean to say, so, you know, I would, pushing 
yourself once you are injured so it do alternative things but then stay fit in other manner as well in other manner and you know you can use that downtime even if you have downtime and you're unable to do something physically instead right. of uh, uh, going down you just stay upbeat and you say to yourself let's plan our next adventure like what could we do next and and how do we go about doing it so you do your True. research you you, you start uh, making uh, your contacts you start uh, finding more on the net how uh, you can accomplish that goal and that is important to not be down when you're hurt a lot of people right. when they get hurt they kind of give up and and their whole thing just falls through uh, and that's not good either True. if you hurt you understand hey you know it's only a couple of weeks uh, we'll be okay in a couple of weeks nothing's going to happen and as soon as uh, i feel better i'm going to uh, start this exercise again so but in the meantime i either got to go swim uh, because my legs are hurting or or if my hand is hurting i got to find out some activity that doesn't use that part of the body right but it's important to be mentally strong and and keep yourself busy right so uh, in the past let's say 15 minutes we've been interacting everything looks very very rosy you know everything is good and you know nothing could ever go wrong it will always be as per plan tell me one instance that uh, the question has come wherein you face the maximum criticism from someone close to you or some friend family or anyone maximum criticism so you know people are always going to criticize people are always going to going to doubt your intentions or people are always going to say you're selfish but uh, some criticisms hurt more than the others so you know uh, most the most criticism that hurts is normally from the ones you love you know the ones that say hey uh, maybe you're doing it you're too selfish right, right. You, you, you haven't you haven't done uh, like you haven't helped around the house or you, you know you're not doing your <laughs> share of 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 your child uh, uh, raising and there's some things that hurt hurt me because you know there's your kids uh, let's say football game but yeah you are out of town on that day and and you know you kind True. of miss those the the music uh, recital or or their performance or their their game and you i always go back to my son or or my wife or my kids and i and i try and explain to them that you know i'm sorry i'm going to miss this but we will make it up next time and right. i'm not missing it because uh i'm i'm missing it because this has been a goal of mine i have worked for the last 3 years on that goal so and and after all the, the your family understands very nice but the the criticism that hurts the most is always the ones that come from the closest to you you know from people uh, hardly matters so so another question is from harbeer he wants to ask you know have you ever had this feeling of left behind sort of a thing any time in any aspect i mean left behind so when i was younger uh, when yeah. i finished my uh, 12th i tried to get into uh, uh, engineering school so I, i gave the iit exam i gave the bit exam all these other exams that right. uh, only the smart people can get in and i didn't get it so at that point uh, you like did i miss the boat uh, right. was was i not good enough and then you realize that you know in life it it doesn't matter you know when one yeah, door yeah. closes other doors open True. so the only reason i went abroad was because i couldn't make it i didn't get into uh, what i wanted to do back home so that gave right. me an opportunity to go abroad and uh, I, i believe that was uh, life changing for me oh yeah so when one door closes other doors open up so uh, there have been moments in life when you kind of realize maybe i'm maybe i didn't get what i want but sometimes that can be a good thing because yeah, no, the next step can be bigger and better exactly very nice other question is you know <clears throat> what frustrates you and how many times do you swear so my biggest frustration is lazy people when i see somebody that has potential but is okay. not willing to put in the hard work needed to realize that potential people sometimes have the talent people sometimes uh have the ability 
but okay. they are unable to challenge themselves. They are unable to channel their ability and their talent to maximize their returns. So they'll, they'll show up for work, but they're not ready for work. Their mind is somewhere else. Or they'll show up for uh, Everest, or, or they'll show up for a race, but they haven't done the right things. So they right. have the ability. They have the talent, but they're not using it for the right thing. It's like you're, you're sitting in an exam and you see somebody cheat and cheat and cheat and cheat. And you know that, you know, all you have to do is if you work a little bit harder, if you had studied, then you wouldn't have to break the law every time. You wouldn't have to cheat. You wouldn't right. have to take all these unfair advantages. So for me, the biggest frustration is to see people that have the ability, have the talent, right. have, have the means, have everything at their disposal, but they're not willing to put in the hard work required to succeed. They want your success. They want everything you have right. without doing what you've done. And, and so, that's frustrating yeah. in, in, in that sense. Correct. Very nice. Okay, I can see a few books there behind you on Everest. Tell me three favorite books of yours. Not Everest, but in general. So uh, I... <laughs> So one of the books is uh, is Into Thin Air, which uh, of okay. course you know we all have read it and watched the movie. So sometimes the books you read is not about what to do, but ab about what not to do, about how right. to face uh, situations, how to face uh, tough questions. And I spend a lot of time reading uh, reading material on people that I find motivating people that I believe have overcome the odds, people that I believe uh, have beaten the, the system that's stacked against them. People aren't born with advantages, people that are born with every disadvantage and, and they kind of beat the odds and, and get somewhere in life. So that to me is motivating. And I spend a lot of time trying to find motivation. Sometimes Very it's nice. in books and sometimes it's in movies and sometimes it's by talking to people. Very nice. Okay, tell me another question which comes is that, you know, what was your biggest worry once you were climbing Everest? What was the thing which was bugging you or worrying you most? Well, the biggest worry was my family. Who will take care of my family if something happened? Even though I had done everything I could. So, you know, uh, I had updated my will. I had I had gone through my insurances. I had, uh, I had a system in place where if I didn't come back, my businesses would still be able to continue and generate revenue and take care of my family. So the biggest thing is, uh, is, is who's going to be there to take care of your family? Who is, uh, who will dance at your son's wedding? You know, I, I will miss that. And those things. Right. Are what motivated me to run in the first place. So when I started running, uh, the biggest motivation was I want to be able to, you know, dance at my son's wedding or play football with him. And, and I figured if if something happened to me, I would not be able to do all that stuff. So everything that right. I had worked hard up till then would go to zero. It worried me a little bit, but then you kind of, you know, learn how to control your mind. Right. And to me, that's important to be able to calm your thoughts or have some control of what goes on in your mind. Your mind is always going to be racing in, in, in a thousand different ways. What if, right. when, how. And then you kind of have to control it and say, nope, let's stay in this moment. Nothing bad's going to happen. I have done my training. I have a strong team. I have done everything that was possible. I did right. my homework. And we're going to succeed and we're going to go home and we're going to have a great time once we go home. Very nice. Okay, another question, last question from the audience, which says that <clears throat> what was your cross training, you know, for various events as well as on Everest also, I mean, there are a lot of times you get tired. How did you recover there or in any, any of the events? What, what kind of cross training did you, did you follow? Uh, normally, my go-to cross training is is uh, walking. So if nothing okay. else works, you just uh, leave your house and you start walking and you try and walk as much as you can. So uh, I do have a gym at the house and and you know there's there's a treadmill, there's a elliptical, uh, nothing fancy. 
and uh, I do use all those pieces of equipment. But my go-to place, if nothing is working, is to just go outside in right. nature and, and just go for a walk. Find some good company, find a, a good audio book, or just be by myself, you know, clear your thoughts. So my go-to cross training, no matter where I am, is to go out for a walk and kind of clear your head up. Very nice. Okay, that's all the questions from the audience. I have one question based on the interaction we have had earlier. So I believe you have two children. Is yes. it right? Yes, and I have two kids. Are they inspired enough by you to be on top of the Everest? Or if they <laughs> plan to do on Everest, would you be guiding them or supporting them? Once uh, you've been through the things, uh, I mean, the kind of challenges are there. Sure, sure. So no matter what my kids want to do, I will always uh, be with them and support them. So my son uh, does run. He's run a half marathon. He has run a marathon. He's 15 years old. And when he was 15, he, he ran a marathon. So he is uh, into cross country and he does run. And he tells me he does not like long distances. He will only run a marathon and nothing longer than that. So <laughs> that makes me that makes me happy. Right. That makes me. Happy. And uh, the biggest things I I want to teach my kid is is not to run or Everest. I mean those are all byproducts. The biggest thing is to make a commitment. And once you make a commitment, to stick to that, to take your, and achieve your goal. So Absolutely. my my biggest uh, when I talk to them isn't that are you going to run or are you going to climb Everest? Those things are trivial. Everest right. is just an obstacle. It's it's what are you going to do if there's a big obstacle obstacle in your way? Are you going to give up or are you going to try and figure a way how to get over that? So whether that be obstacle of an Everest or whether that be a forty two kilometer obstacle or whether that be a half marathon, those things are trivial. They're, they're not important. Main important thing is how do, you, how do you overcome things that come in your life and how do you achieve your goals? How do you uh, put things on paper and how are you able to talk your way out of trouble? Amazing. <laughs> so Ricky, I think that's up what we have time for today. But then it's been an extremely, extremely enlightening session. I'm glad we've recorded it. And this is going to be with us for, I mean, lifelong, whenever, not just for Everest or marathon, but then life lessons, as we say. I mean, very, very insightful. Really enjoyed. And thank you so very much for your time because we know, you know, you've been extremely busy. It's been morning over there. You've got so many goals to do. But then we are so, so thankful from all the viewers side. Very, very I mean, deepest gratitude. And for the viewers, I would like to say that uh, Ricky, as we know, is always be ready to share whatever knowledge he has. He has already committed. And I mean, we know him for the past one, one and a half years. He'll be more than happy to assist anyone for any kind of guidance which is there. So please, please feel free. And once again, thank you so much, sir. It's been great interacting. Thank you so much, uh, Romal. It has been a pleasure. And I tell you, you're a wonderful person for doing this. And you inspire so many of us. Uh, you know, you were a great inspiration. And I want to share a story with uh, with everyone. I don't know if people know this, but you know, when we were on Everest, we had a girl uh, with us on the team and she was coming down and she got into right. trouble. And her Sherpa wasn't quite helping her the way he should have or could have. Right. And at that moment, she turned to you and you selflessly got your team and helped her out of trouble. And I believe if you hadn't done that, she would have lost her toes, her fingers, maybe even her life, had it not been for your uh, generosity and, and, and helpfulness. And hats off to you. And, and thank you so much for, for doing what you do for everyone. Thank you no, so thank much. You so, thanks so much sir, for the kind words. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank Bye. You. Good night, everyone, and good day to you. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Good night, sir. Good night, guys.